as far as different types of functions, different uh, techniques can be applied for motor in particular. There are a variety of different things that we can do beyond this direct uh, cortical stimulation. There's um, phase reversal, motor evoked potentials, direct cortical stimulation, and subcortical mapping as well. Um, uh, starting from the top, uh, phase reversal uh, technique is basically when we are applying a sort of greater strip of electrodes to the surface of the brain in the region that we think is um, uh, uh, across the central sulcus of the brain, a change in the dipole um, uh, of the current occurs over the central sulcus. So if we've got this grid of electrodes over, we're looking on the monitor to find where that phase reversal occurs and that occurs over the central sulcus. It identifies that, you know, um, quite reliably in a way that just looking at the brain or looking at an MRI um, is sort of subject to, uh, to error. And obviously when it comes to motor or sensory cortex, um, you know, the, the cost of being wrong is quite high. And then, you know, another advantage of these is that they can be used under general anesthesia. Other sort of real time uh, techniques uh, can be used like motor evoked potentials, not of sensory evoked potentials, and these can be done um, transcranially or with a grid in place. And there is good data to suggest that these um, help predict post-operative deficit. Um, beyond that, we can do subcortical and cortical um, white matter motor tract mapping. And this can be done with the patient asleep as well too. This is basically where we take a bipolar, a monopolar probe and, um, and trigger uh, a motor response um, by stimulating some place in the brain. And we're sort of getting a readout from the distal muscle groups. And studies indicate that the amount of current that it takes to trigger one of these responses, especially in the deep white matter, can correlate to the distance from those currents. And that's really data shown from the study here from Shahar and, and company that that's basically um, lead us to conclude that there's a correlation of about one milliamp per millimeter distance from um, these motor tracks. So this can sort of be done, the stimulation mapping can be done interchangeably with resection. And as you get closer and closer to the critical motor fibers, you see less and less amperage required to stimulate a motor response. And how this comes into play is when you have a, a tumor like this, that's really wrapped up in the motor cortex, you know, you go in there and you find a way into the lesion by going through some area of brain that does not stimulate or trigger a motor response or requires a higher amplitude to trigger that. And you can carry the resection closer and closer to those motor fibers um, by, by checking your distance and your sort of functionality of the brain in real time with the simulation. And again, we're sort of able to measure the responses from different muscle groups um, as, as we go. And these types of techniques enable us to be able to do a resection um, in, in many cases of, of tumors that are near highly eloquent areas, like in this case where you have a tumor really straddling motor and sensory and you know, pictures from the surgery might look something like this. Language mapping, on the other hand, um, requires an awake patient. Uh, this significantly complicates the surgery in some regards in that it requires and addi additional planning, often rehearsal, sometimes a larger craniotomy and longer operative times. Uh, stimulation um, is applied while testing functions, um, uh, in particular language, uh, counting, object naming, sentence completion, um, you know, and, and looking for interruptions to that um, from the stimulation. Um, you know, some other difficulties that are encountered um, can be, you know, inducing, a seizure in, in patients by um, repetitive stimulation, but thankfully this can be solved with uh, cold saline. Um, when it comes to actually resecting tumors and, and using the stimulation mapping information, um, there's sort of two strategies that are undertaken. One is sort of a negative stimulation mapping, which is basically if, if an area of brain is stimulated and doesn't uh, induce a language or other functional deficit, then the theory would go that it could be safely resected. A positive stimulation 
strategy would sort of require identification of the region of brain responsible for whatever function you're looking for. So if you're looking for, you know, speech production, you would need to find the area that stimulation sort of it caused a halt in speech production to make sure that that was separate from the resection rather than just targeting the region of the brain uh, and, and checking that it didn't cause any functional decline. Um, I think, you know, one of the recent uh, things that we've come to appreciate more is that this classical language organization model not really tell the full picture. You know, this is the, the concept that sort of, you know, Broca's and Wernicke's area are connected by, by the arcuate fasciculus. That's certainly um, true to some degree, but the networks I think are much more complicated and, and varied. And I think an updated model um, is shown in this uh, figure here. This is a uh, paper from uh, Berger's group. And I think it, it shows how, um, you know, beyond just those sort of two classical regions, there's really language can be dependent on multiple areas, uh, multiple cortical interactions and subcortical white matter tracts. And the different nuanced studies um, help us appreciate how these different tracks uh, function and different types of errors um, can be uh, attributed to lesions in different areas uh, based on which sort of tracks are involved. So again, you know, the, what this looks like at surgery is this application of you know, the bipolar simulator to different cortical areas and mapping out exactly what part is related to language, what part is, um, or, or in this case, motor with face, arm, and hand following the homunculus and keeping those areas separate from the resection, which then takes place beyond that. Um, this type of uh, stimulation mapping in awake brain surgery certainly captivates the uh, attention of the media and there's no shortage of these kind of articles where different folks are uh, tested in different means. Um, you know, the, the types of testings that can be done with awake surgery are not limited to just motor and speech, but in different regions of the brain that are responsible, especially for like musical technique and musical appreciation are things that are, we're able to test intraoperatively as well too. And uh, some of the clips here are from some different cases where people have either uh, been performing, you know, uh, by singing uh, while undergoing uh, brain tumor resection or playing a musical instrument like guitar or violin, or, you know, in, in this day and age, uh, the new instrument uh, of everyone's choice of live streaming on uh, Facebook. But all of this um, mapping has certainly led us to appreciate um, uh, deeper understanding of, you know, which areas of the brain are really critical for language function or other functions and really just gain tremendous insight in further into how the brain works. They generate um, these sort of uh, probability maps of different regions of the brain of, you know, what is the probability of it not being involved in speech. And you can see that um, sort of centered around the sort of classical idea for Broca's and Wernicke's area, there are some more speech activations, but it's certainly far from any kind of anatomic uh, map or diagram and is highly variable from patient to patient. That all being said, there is good data to support that the use of all these mapping strategies uh, can be um, can help increase the extent of resection of tumors and decrease uh, neurologic deficits. That's really uh, borne out in this meta-analysis from DeWitt Hammer uh, and and company, which um, you know I think. Uh, having it go sort of both ways is really optimal, you know, decreasing deficits, increasing extent of resection. Uh, so that's, you know, one that really uh, needs to be utilized. Um, once mapping is complete, you know, we determine resectability and try to remove the tumor um, in a, uh, whatever fashion is sort of feasible given how close or far it is from eloquent areas. Um, if feasible, well, we like to perform, you know, an on-block an technique, which is basically removing the tumor in one, one piece, um, if separate enough from uh, those functional areas. I think I'll skip over uh, some of this in the interest of time. This is what, um, you know, that kind of resection um, would look like removing the tumor. And, you know, with good functional mapping, even, you know, tumors that look like they're located in motor and sensory or in language areas uh, can, you know, even ones displacing all of those aforementioned tracks can be removed safely and often in an on-block uh, fashion um, with no 
uh, functional limitations. So uh, putting all this together is really how we optimize uh, the resection, you know, safe resection of uh, patients with primary malignant tumors. Um, I have a few notes on some other things, which I think we'll skip over in the interest of time, unless anyone has any um, specific question on that. Um, I think um, you know, we can sort of wrap things up here and just leave it at, you know, uh, with the conclusion, uh, detailed planning and appropriate use of these techniques. We can maximize uh, the extent of resection and not, and, you know, do this without incurring additional uh, costs in terms of post-operative deficits. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.